destroyed everything. Hello. We've got. Hello. We, we turned on the microphone. <laughs> we are puzzled. Do people hear the Bioshock audio beneath this? The piano. Yeah, it's all here. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Hey guys, uh, this seems to be working, which is really surprising because usually it doesn't. Uh, so good for us. <laughs> we did it. Um, this is uh, JP LeBreton, and he was uh, one of the designers on the original Bioshock at Irrational Games. And he now actually works with me at uh, Double Fine, and we're both, uh, we're both working on the cave, uh, which is cool. And uh, yeah, we've been buddies for a while, and uh, he is going to play Bioshock and talk about it. Yeah, uh, about all the you know, hopefully interesting insights. Some into inside baseball. What went on yeah. during the development of the game, and like why some of the decisions were made the way they were, and uh, all that stuff. So, yes, we don't know how this is going to work or anything, but um, I don't know. Hopefully, it'll be good. Jake will be back soon. Jake is feeding yeah. a cat right now, and uh, he is driving back to the office now. But we didn't want to delay this too much. So that's happening. Um, also, all of the graphics on the screen right now, with the exception of the ones in Bioshock, are Jake's handiwork. So enjoy <laughs> the hilarious mainframe '70s, '60s, and '70s era electronics and graphics. So good, going so on. down. Yeah, he did a good job. Uh, let's. I don't know. What can we switch to? That's also a funny, a funny thing here. Um, oh, this is funny. Got gold cam. So this is one, one our, small. Here's a one big esteemed member of our panel, and uh, <laughs> he's here. <laughs> he's staying very still. Uh, what else? What uh, else can we show off here? And lording. Um, yeah, we we have all kinds of good, all kinds of good good shit going on with this. Uh, yeah, this thing. So yeah. Should we just should we just get going? What do you want to do? You want to just start playing the game? Yeah, yeah, sure. Fine. Right. Yeah. So we're just going to switch back to the uh, full game mode, and we we might we might come back into camera mode occasionally, but probably most of the time we're just going to be uh, in the game. So go ahead, JP. All right. Okay. Um. Oh, and if people have questions, you can ask them in chat, and JP won't be able to see them, but I'll be able to see them, and I can pass stuff on. To, uh, yeah, I, actually, I can see because we've oh, got actually, Chrome yeah, in the background here. Yeah, so actually I've got. Can't see the chat, so that's, that's yeah, fine. yeah, it's good. Um, okay, yeah. Um, I don't know if I have anything interesting to say about the the start menu. Um, there were a whole bunch of different versions of this uh, of the lighthouse intro start new game thing. One of them was like a clo that we had for a while was like a close up of a little sister's hands handling like a big daddy doll, mm -hmm. which was just like creepy and weird. And it was like the first <laughs> image you were going to see. And I think people lost their nerve about doing that and maybe it also wasn't so good because this is a nice enigmatic cool thing um, yeah. I guess the, is the PC version not doing the piano roll thing where you can roll over it that was something that the console versions did I think where you would just like roll over different items in this start menu and get different piano things and it was mysterious I remember that happening is that not doing that right now? oh I think it might just be on click oh okay yeah okay um yeah I've played other shooters so uh <laughs> I'll do medium. Um, I kind of want to do easy, just so that we can be in tourist mode and I won't have to worry about Too getting my now. brain shot. All right. So yeah. Now you're screwed. Here it is. So yeah, here's the intro. What levels you designed? Um, I was the primary designer on Arcadia, and I worked on other stuff at earlier so, points, just kind of all over the place. I'll, I'll talk about it as we go. You were born to do great. So things. this is the intro, which is the only point uh, besides the ending where we hear you know the protagonist of Bioshock speak. Uh, this they is the voice, at, and I will say this many times. So take a drink each time. Uh, this is the voice of Nate Wells. Uh, the what's his title at Irrational now? Nate Wells is actually now the art director on Bioshock. Yeah, he's the art director of Bioshock awesome Infinite. Uh, uh, yeah, and he worked at Looking Glass. Yeah, he's an amazing human being. Um, he's extremely intelligent and witty, and uh, uh, an amazing artist. He designed the Big Daddies, or he was one of the big guys. Who who designed the Big Daddies, um, and yeah, and I miss him, miss working with him, and yeah, and he has a great, he has a great 
voice uh, that shows up in a lot of places in Bioshock 1 and will probably show up in a lot of places in Bio Infinite. Uh, yeah. So yeah. By the way, this is going to be like a probably pretty spoiler laden and like watching the DVD commentary. So if you've never played Bioshock before, I don't know. Just like yeah, this is going to be just gibberish on top of. Yeah. Someone's recommending actually going into the game audio and turning it down a bit. Which is oh, a good idea. okay. Like yeah. in the actual game. Audio. Yes. Yeah. How about some options? Uh, is this the volume slider? Whoa. What? <laughs> It's a slider that changes between quad, stereo, and mono. <laughs> That's nonsense. Okay. Um, is this the global sound effect volume? People are saying I'm too quiet. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, the reason for that is just because the audio is from our webcam, because that's how you can see JP when he's on the screen. So I'm just farther away. I'm just farther away from the thing, so I'm, I'm not going to be super loud. Sorry about that. Cool. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, we've bobbed to the surface in the middle of the freezing Atlantic, um, and there's a tail section of of a plane sinking, slowly sinking into the water. Um, <laughs> this is the kind of key insight this, uh, you can expect. The logo on this uh, on this tail section might show up in a game in the future that you should maybe watch out for. Possibly something from uh, from from Steve Gainer and Co. Uh, and yeah, and this is the lighthouse. It's uh, a lot of people that we we saw in testing, and a lot of people that I've just seen play the game since. Um, at the after you bob to the surface and are just looking out on this kind of thing, they didn't know that the game had started yet, yeah. um, which is is cool. Like I like that, um, you know, that it, it, it felt like that much of a seamless transition and stuff. Right. Uh, that 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 thing at the beginning. Oh yeah, and you can watch the rest of the tail section sink. Um, I think there's collision volumes around the rest of this island, but you can kind of just do laps if you're really not good at video games. Or just like to explore, and then there's <laughs> so this this uh, the Andrew the giant Andrew Ryan here is hilarious, and it's just a it's just a like draw scaled by a factor of ten. Uh, it's the same as the bust of Andrew Ryan that you see probably in other <laughs> yeah. places, like in his office in Hephaestus and such. Uh, but yeah, so really huge Andrew Ryan. <laughs> Drawn ever downward. Science. She blinded me with it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and we're hearing uh, Jenga Reinhardt's cover of Beyond the Sea, which is beautiful and timeless. Um, and yeah. And then we hit a switch and we go into Bioshock. Yeah, multiple fathoms. So um, this whole section here, which which uh, the, the the game level that that uh, that we call we referred to it during all of development was is Lighthouse, um, and Demiurge Studios of Boston actually did the initial build out of this in like for like the first half or maybe most of 2006, and then we took it in house and took it you know did a whole bunch of more development on it. But yeah, it's, they got the ball rolling and probably built a lot of the assets that you see in the Lighthouse and stuff. And yes, here's Andrew Ryan's famous slideshow monologue. Um, the basic shtick for this about why Andrew Ryan hates all the different, you know, political entities in the world uh, was written very early. That was really part of Ken's formulation of Andrew Ryan as a character and, you know, his motivation for creating Rapture. Um, so in that sense, like, yeah, the, like, Bioshock's world was, was fairly fiction-led. But a lot of other stuff tumbled out a little more emergently. And this... I still like this vista. And there's a giant squid. Finley in the sign here refers to Alyssa Finley, the game's. Uh, I forget what her title was on Bio One. She was like the head executive producer, and and one and the, pretty much the person, uh, the, you know, uh, the founder of Two K Marin. Uh, and it was her and Jordan Thomas who asked me to come out uh, in November of 2007 to to, to go found Two K Marin after we had shipped Bioshock. Here's a giant whale. Um, <laughs> This whale doesn't actually look very good at all. <laughs> uh, if you just look at it up close, it's like a big toy-looking thing, but but it's awesome. And I think that's probably a big part of Bioshock, is that like it has some amazing individual assets, but then there's other things that are just barely good enough to look really good for the few seconds that they're on screen, or just to make that illusion kind of pass as for as long as it needs to. Um, 
and that's you know, it's just don't do any more work than you need to to make to get to get an impressive effect if an impressive effect is all you're going for here. Um, I really shouldn't have played Bioshock 2 before one. Yeah, well, you know, how involved was Ken in the different aspects of the game? Uh, was he going around enforcing a particular vision? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, he's he's he, he is he was that kind of a hands-on creative auteur kind of guy. Um, so the voice of Johnny here, which is Atlas's assistant that we're about to see eviscerated, that is also Nate Wells doing his best, like, circa 1990, 1977 uh, Mark Hamill impression, kind of. That's what I've always thought. It's like, because he's like, the sphere! The sphere's coming up now! Oh, Atlas, it's... I'm gonna die! Etc. Uh, he's just showing as many talents. Yeah, this, so this whole bit right here uh, is very much like the game's first bid for real horror. It's like, yeah, it's dark and spooky and incredibly terrifying and terrible down here. Um, I know that uh, Jordan Thomas uh, and Stephen Alexander, uh, Jordan went on to be, you know, the creative director and founder of, of Tiki Marin, along with the other seven of us. And uh, Stephen Alexander, who's still like the visual effects guy yeah. at Irrational, and incredibly talented, both and of them. And it's kind of one of the key... Definitely on Infinite is kind of one of the key guys involved with, you know, maintaining the yeah. kind of vision of the game with yeah. Ben. And, the yeah, the sauce. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they worked together really closely to get, like, the timing of this whole moment with the ceiling crawler killing, uh, I think, yeah, Rosie, uh, killing Johnny, and the whole lights flickering and her screaming. and Because I think, and the lighting was really the key part of it, because if we had shown much more of Rosebud's face, that, that's the splicer type, the girl and the, the lady in the jumpsuit. If we had shown much more of that with, with lighting, like kept the lights on for a little longer, it would have completely fallen flat. But as it was, like this flickery shadow play type thing where you don't really know what the hell you're looking at yet, um, you know, was really... Yeah. I'm Atlas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Atlas is introducing you, asking you to kindly pick up the uh, the radio, which you do, as if mysteriously compelled. The shade's coming down is a big moment here for some people. You get to see the city, and you're just like, oh yeah, this is crazy. Um, fun fact, um... Atlas was originally voiced by a guy with like a southern accent uh, up till about uh, January of 2007 um, when you know people just like really responded very negatively like testers and stuff really responded negatively to as we called him like southern Atlas or lecherous Colonel Sanders Atlas uh, and so Ken was like after like at that focus test basically Ken was like I'm gonna completely rewrite Atlas and cast a cast a different guy and stuff uh, no offense to the voice actor who did uh, you know, who did that initial read? Uh, he had a great Fontaine, actually. He, I think he. A lot of people feel like he did a much better job voicing Fontaine, and this Atlas is maybe a weaker Fontaine. But all right, so we get the crowbar. We get attacked. Whoa! All right, this is our first splicer in the game. Uh, this guy, the guy with like the big lip, and who? Yeah, just. A little bit of a lateral lisp and stuff. Uh, this splicer type, I can't make him turn around even by beating his poor corpse. This guy was called Toasty. Like, we had these internal names uh, that I think exist on the Bioshock wiki because people went digging through the data files. Uh, and this guy was called Toasty for reasons that are just too arcane to be interesting to recount. But yeah, Toasty uh, became kind of his own thing because he's got just, you know, he's his lines and just, you know, he's just a hilarious dude who is actually a really terrible person. Like, he's a bad, genuinely bad person. But uh, he's everywhere in this game, and he shows up like 50 bazillion times in this first level of Bioshock, so we love him. Toasty, I think, has a Tumblr as well. Somebody's doing, like, Toasty fan art. So, goes to show. Uh, yeah, and here's the first Gatherer's Garden. It's crazy. Why would, I ever, why would I ever do this? Why would I land underwater and then just slam this into my arm? But, uh... Yeah. I do like that we managed to add a little bit of, an, of a hesitation in the animation when you first jab the thing in because, you know, you wouldn't be very blasé about slamming a needle full of genetic enhancements into your arm. Um, 
it's maybe still a little cavalier, and I remember people saying that they that they wondered about it. And now we go into the slipping the player a Mickey conked out cutscene where we get to show you splicers and big daddies and little sisters up close for the first time. The voice of this guy here, uh, talking about yeah, getting your cherry popped and weak choppers and all kinds of other flavorful dialogue. That's that voice is Dorian Hart, uh, an old an old time uh, designer uh, who first worked on Ultima Underworld two and just worked on pretty much every every like every looking glass and irrational project. And now he I think he's working on like the card battler game with John Che and stuff. So yeah, he he's doing the indie thing. But uh, yeah, good old Dorian. Big Daddy doing a comical stomp. Look, Mr. Bubbles. It's, it's a cutscene. An angel. God, the thing is creepy. I can see light coming from his belly. I do actually like these lines. Wait a minute. He's still breathing. It's all right. I know he'll be an angel soon. He'll be an angel soon. soon. Yeah. It's good. And not showing the little sister's face during that is definitely a good move, because they did not look good up close, and also, less is more. You all right, boy? I'm all right. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess there isn't anything like a fistful of lightning. All right. Opportunity awaits. Uh, yeah. They're not wrong. So this little thing here where the tail section crashes into the tunnel, um, this is a nice, like, there's a screen shake animation that plays on the player's viewport there, and uh, I really like how it ends with the player looking up and to the left a little bit so that you're very likely to catch the tail section. It's like, it's a very hands-off way, like, a lot of other developers probably would have just taken control of the player and forced you to look at it, whereas, like, very subtly, like Amnesia The Dark Descent does a little bit of that as well, where it's like we want you to look at something, but we're not going to be you know, heavy-handed jerks about it, so we're just going to like wobble your view when it has a reason to be wobbled anyway, and now you're looking at the thing that we want you to look at. And then you can kind of appreciate it for on its own merits as a player instead of as a viewer, basically. <laughs> Alright, we're about to have our first... Wait, I forget what you do with this. Oh yeah, that's right. There's like this weird trigger type thing where you walk around and then you're like, oh, oh, it's a guy. Um, <sighs> and yeah, there's the one-two punch. The one-two punch was like, yeah, it 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 sounds like a pseudo game mechanic. It was really just like we wanted to incentivize plasmid use, and we were like, well, if it combos with weapons but is not destructive itself so that people don't just try to use plasmids like guns. You know, it was like this kind of collision of factors. Um, oh yeah, and I totally walked over one of the more hilarious bits of VO where it's like this guy pleading with... It was a completely like orphaned beat that I think we just kept in. But this, this guy who comes out of the elevator here was like, Tell Ryan I'm sorry! I'll blah blah blah! And he ends up like just pleading with the guys who I guess blow up that elevator and cause it to plunge. And he, he's like, right before the thing goes up, he's like, No! Please! Please! And he just sounds like, he sounds like Tanzit from Space Ghost, you know? It's just this weird little simpering milk toast of a voice. And But it's just another toasty. It's fine. You, he's on fire, and then you put him out of his misery. I've got a family. We're starting to build sympathy for this unreliable narrator. And yeah, some, some beautiful music by uh, uh, Gary Scheinman, right? Yeah. And just, just bringing the strings, the tragic so beauty hear, of yeah. Rapture you in its fallen state. Gary Scheinman music actually in the demo too for Bioshock Infinite. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, cool. So, yeah. yeah. I think there was a bug once where you could, uh, you could. Oh, did we blocking volume that? That's lame. Uh, where yeah, you could totally like electrobolt that guy, and it would cause hilarious bugs to happen, even though he was just meant to be a door banger. Like the guy, like the Barney at the beginning of Half-Life 1 who's banging on that door during the tram ride. Shadow play. Yeah, Jordan uh, Jordan Thomas, who, yeah, was creative director of Bio 2 and worked on Shellbridge Cradle, the, the, the infamously scary Thief 3 mission. Um, 
came on, like I guess in January of 2007, and in addition to being the primary level designer on Fort Frolic, um, he also just like Ken commissioned him to do a horror pass on the game to just like see what could be done to make the game scary. And I don't know if this specifically was like his, you know, something that he that he recommended, but you know, just seeing things in shadow more and like turning out the lights sometimes and just putting the player off at, at, at off ease, off off center and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yep. And this crazy lady is gonna. I guess this is the first time that you see Lady Smith, uh, this lady splicer type, and she's nuts because, as we soon see, after murdering her ruthlessly, as we soon see, she's got a giant size revolver and a baby stroller, which becomes normal size when I pick it up. I shouldn't really rag on this game as much as I do. I'm just, you know, I worked on it, and so I just see all the ridiculous bugs. Um, but yeah, but it's beautiful. This was um, like this moment. I had people talk tell me afterwards that this was the moment where Bioshock, the violence in Bioshock, and the combat really started alienating them because this image of this woman like talking to something in a baby stroller, and then she just like loses it and comes after you was like. That's a genuinely like disturbing, you know, it's it's very clearly speaking to this lost humanity and all that. And it was this but, you know, of course she's just another FP first person shooter enemy and you're meant to just dispatch her on the as the first of many. Um, and yeah, like that that is troubling to me, you know. I would really like to work on a game, well, maybe not anymore, but I you know, making games like BioShock only there's no combat, but there's, you know, that kind of size and sumptuousness of world. You know, like, it's, yeah, it'd be good to do. Um, this fish pillar is one of the many touch loving touches of uh, Hoagie de la Plante. Uh, the, he was just like an artist on Bioshock 1 and was one of the founders of 2K Marin, and we worked together as leads of the level stuff on Bioshock 2. He's an awesome guy. He's working at Microsoft now, and I love him. Working at Microsoft I, Yes, yeah. Um, so this is, of course, the cashmere. I, I, I promise that the... That the uh, density of landmarks and callouts will, will will lessen as time goes on, but there's obviously a lot of significant stuff. This is probably one of the defining images of Bioshock here because you know it's the New Year's party where a, a terrorist bomb exploded at the Kashmir, killing a bunch of aristocrats, and this was really the the night that everything started to go down the tubes in Rapture, where you know the the, the class tensions and all that kind of stuff bubbled to the surface. Terrible violence, lots of people getting killed here. Um, so someone's asking about graphic design stuff, and like, oh yeah. When I when I was at Irrational, it was mainly I saw JP. It'll be interesting to hear if this is the same as when you were there. When I was at Irrational, it was mainly guys like Mike Switerek, Joy, George Lucera, um, uh, uh, doing a lot of the graphic design stuff, and hmm. um, to some degree, uh, Rob Waters, uh, depending on the thing in question, but. Yeah. Like who, who would have done this stuff in? Um, when you were I'm pretty sure this was. I'm pretty sure this was Rob. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like that's probably true of a lot of. Uh, this might have been Swid. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was. There were relatively few graphic artists, and I think a lot of other folks like you know Scott Sinclair, Hoagie Dill Plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Scott was doing less of that when I was there. Cause yeah. Was more of a I, and I don't know how many 2D assets specifically he contributed to the game, but you know like. All, all of those folks' hand is clear in a lot of this. This is one of Hoagie's paintings. He does, like, oil paintings and landscapes and stuff. And this, so that's Hoagie's painting that's all over Rapture. There's probably a few more. Um, and, yeah, it was a masquerade ball, so there's weird animal masks. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, the graphic design stuff was, like, kind of a triumvirate. Um, yeah, downstairs here we've got a looping... Brenda and Charlie scripting thing going here. So I wasn't the primary level designer on this up till ship, but I did work on, I worked on pretty much the earliest version of this, which would have been shortly after I started at Irrational in early 2006. Uh, I started at Irrational in November of 2005. And so yeah, this this version basically was like what I was working on, you know, like it, it everything that happened and all that, it went through a ton of iterations, so I don't want to take credit for all the amazing stuff that's in this level, but, uh, but yeah, and I also, I guess I pinch hit doing the scripting for this Brenda and Charlie thing, just kind of based on Ken's specification, because this is like, yeah, these guys, it's like a couple having an argument, and I guess Brenda and Charlie, uh, they've just had a tiff, and Charlie is pleading for Brenda to... Charlie, where are you going? Charlie, where are you going? No. Oh, and then she sees that you've killed Charlie, and guess what? She's another splicer to be annihilated. Um, and yeah, fairly gruesome blood overlay effects and stuff. Um, 
So yeah, it's real dark. You know, now you, you've killed a woman distraught about losing her baby, probably, and now a couple that was having an argument, and now they'll never resolve it because they're dead. Someone's uh, asking if you know me in Bond. Uh, yeah, 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 I totally, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was a he was a gameplay programmer, and he coded up our sweet view triggers and a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, Ian Bond was a sweet programmer guy. I, I, haven't, I haven't talked to him in several years now. Um, yeah. The Cashmere. Um, here's one of the audio logs. I'm not going to listen to audio logs because we'll just talk over them anyway. But they're all lovely and... Um, this used to be like a much larger pile of bodies because the idea was that after the bomb went off, everybody stampeded to get out and just trampled each other, which is horrifying. But I think the, the huge stack of bodies was just taken out for, for performance reasons. And and big pile of ragdolls will probably become janky reasons. Um, I'm playing really uninterestingly here, partly because I don't have much in the way of cool tools yet, and also just because I'm it's tough to talk and talk cohesively and... Play a video game well. well. Would you kindly, would you kindly lower, lower that weapon? weapon? That's funny. Why would I just lower you that weapon? Like he asks. Um, this is like a look that you get at a little sister. Uh, you lower your weapons because, yeah, like you could just pop the little sister before and yada yada. There's a lot of little kind of subtle growling and not so subtle maybe. And this is the first good look you get at. Uh, a toasty beating on a little sister, I guess. And then a big daddy showing up and doing ruthless ultraviolence on the guy. Yep, so that's 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 toasty. You can see him pretty clearly here. Oh, shh. That's so sinister. She screams and he's like, ugh. <laughs> he's screaming and yeah. he's like, ugh. And then, yeah. <laughs> Insightful. Yeah, oh yeah. That's all toasty ever says. Toasty is realizing that he's made a very grave mistake, and now ultra violence is performed. We'll head bash. Um, that's the big daddy. Yep. That's an aggro. That's the bouncer type big daddy, which I think is shown in game and like the research and stuff. Um, this was initially where you were going to get the pistol. Yeah, and, and he still, in fact, has a revolver pickup, even though we got a pistol from the from the baby carriage. Because it was going to be like you d you only had the wrench up until this point, but I think we decided that like it was too long to go without without a gun because it's a shooter, you know. Uh, I, I say that sort of apologetically, just as much as factually. But um, but yeah, and and then you shoot that lock, uh, which is kind of a weird little mechanic that we threw in sometimes. Slow the player down and gate. The old Electro Bolt head bullet. A classic. So, someone wants to know if the game always had an Art Deco style to it. Uh, in its modern form, yeah. That's a very unfortunate toasty skin. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know if you've heard, like, there, there, there was press on Bioshock at the time that it was, like, it wasn't an Art Deco Metropolis underwater. It was, like, I don't know, like, at different points, Bioshock took was place like on a space... Island. Well, it took place on, like, in 2002-ish, Bioshock took place on a space station where they had been doing genetic experiments, and when it really was just System Shock 3 and all but name. And then it was on an island that was run by a cult, and you were cult deprogrammer Carlos Coelho, which is hilarious because he was one of the... He's the technical direct, director at 2K Marin. Uh, and then it was an underwater base that had been used by, like, the Nazis or something. Or just, like, it was, like, a World War II underwater research lab. And then th from there it more gracefully interpolated into being an Art Deco underwater city. Um, and that whole transition was was most... was starting to happen um, around the time that I started in November of 2005. And, like, we built the first real level that was like, oh, yeah, this is, art, this is an Art Deco city, and, man, it looks beautiful. We think we've got something unique and cool here. Um, in fact, the Kashmir, the, the, the space with the blown up statue and all that, uh, was the very first space that Art built in, I think, August of 2005. Uh, and that was like really the proof of, that was the Art proof of concept for we can build a good looking Art Deco space. Um, and like that statue is basically the same asset. Um, that was really the prototype for Rapture looking how I did. Okay, I just drank a whole bunch of gin and got drunk here. Uh, the drunk scripting in Bioshock does actually 
it uses a, a variable for blood alcohol level. It's you know it's real simple scripting and programming and stuff, but uh, yeah, it tracks your blood alcohol level. And there was support that was not used in Bioshock One for making different types of alcohol get you drunk at different rates. Uh, and we actually revisited that for Bioshock Two. Uh, Jen Hallcroft, our, our systems designer. Uh, revisited that and so in Bioshock 2 different types of alcohol do actually make you get drunk at different rates like I think absinthe will just you know it only, it only takes two toots of it uh, so yeah we'll go into the plot hole here Security alert in yeah Jake just got here uh, so yeah that's one of the few flamethrower turrets in the game security is banging off all over you get a whole bunch of opportunities to let these dudes in the water Atlas is gonna say, "Oh yeah, I'm shooting so many men." Jake just arrived. Hi, I wanted to make sure that uh, Jake was shooting guys. Yeah, <laughs> make sure you shoot the guy and the lady. It's Bioshock is is maybe distressingly equal opportunity. You know, it's it, there's a male and female splicer population because we didn't want it to just be video game mans running around in military world. So it's like, but yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, you kill a lot of crazy ladies, and it's kind of troubling in a different way. Someone's also asking about uh, how long the Ayn Rand objectivist angle was in the game. Uh, like, that makes it sound as if it was cut. Like, just the... No, I mean, like, how so going at what point did it appear? Yeah, it appeared right around the time that it was like an Art Deco uh, utopia. An underwater Art Deco utopia. I think, like, Andrew Ryan being uh, an objectivist dude, you know, and and the underwater city, I think all of that came together around the same time. That would have been, like, early to mid-2005, really. And that was really just, like, you know, what Ken was reading and, you know, the, the formulation of that and then pushing on art to do the Art Deco thing. Uh, the game's design was, like, you know, was kind of weirdly out of sync with a lot of that because it was just considered to be like, well, it doesn't matter what fictional wrapper we put on this. And that proved problematic later because, you know, a whole bunch of design changes happen and stuff. Not really to accommodate objectivism so much, but to just, you know, like, when the aesthetic of your game shifts, you kind of do have to shift the mechanics, honestly, you know. Um, so, yeah, we're about to get to... Um, I kind of want to... Yeah, so there's a sweet bug you can use if you're speedrunning or something where, yeah, you can go into this room without triggering the whole getting... Sh and if I electrobolt that door there, I will instantly load into the medical pavilion level. Uh, and that's just like a bug in how reactive actors work in our engine. But now that you know that and you know that I'm cool, uh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it will trigger the which one of the bitches sent you cutscene, as we called it. Or not a cutscene, but... Atlas is pan panicking. Do you know, JP, I don't actually know the answer to this. Someone's asking, they think the Deus Ex 1 maybe was also originally a better programmer? Is that, as far as you know, is that I don't know, I've never heard that. Um, that would be one for, yeah, Harvey Smith and stuff. Uh, I've never heard that either. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. So this is Andrew Ryan making his first real, quote-unquote, on-screen appearance, and he says, So tell me, friend, which one of the bitches sent you? The CIA wolf or the KGB jackal? And it's, you know, it's what it's where his head is at. You know, he just knows that there's an interloper from the surface coming down. But it's a good moment. Like, in a game where you don't have, like, cutscenes where characters show up and, you know, talk into your face and stuff, you have to, like, get characters on screen in different ways. And, like, Atlas having a, having a portrait for his radio, having a radio portrait was a big way to get... Uh, Atlas on screen, yeah, we see this big George Clooney face there. And then Andrew Ryan, it's like, yeah, well, who is this guy? Well, we see his bust, and then we see his face big on the screen. It's a lot of people on screens, you know? R Andrew Ryan is basically show Danning in that moment there, and that's really, like, there's a reason for that. You know, it's like, when you have mostly environmental antagonists who are, you know, who speak to you through radio, it's like, yeah, you need some, you need some face time with them to really get that full character connection. Um... Yeah. You need to make sure they're represented by at least two overlapping other textures. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, so yeah, now we're in the medical pavilion, which is a dynamite level. This was this was originally just all one in the same level file with with Welcome, like in its early days when I was working on it. Do we actually um, do we want to take this opportunity to maybe shut down the stream and see if we can get the lag, get rid of the lag, and come back? Like oh, is it starting a new area? Yeah. Does that? Um. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We could do that. Um. Yeah. We're gonna, oh, sorry guys, we're gonna, we know it's been laggy, so we're going to deal with one of the, the gun run, one of the guys from, from Twitch TV, and uh, 
we're going to deal with him. We're, we're going to deal. We're going to take him out back, uh, and then he's going to give us some tips uh, about. How, then we're going to come back in from the back, and it'll be fine. Okay. Cool. All right. Sh should I quit out of this? Quit, you don't need to quit the game, but okay. we're just going to turn off the stream. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, all right. So Alt Tab.